a brand new webinar series for 2024. This is our global webinar series of Mind Medicine Australia. And we're starting this year's series, series with Dr. Wade Davis of Canada, one of the world's really great anthropologists and explorers. We'll be introducing him in a couple of moments. To begin with today, we um, would like to welcome all of you here and we acknowledge also the lands on which we stand, our elders past and present. And we particularly acknowledge the medicine keepers, the light keepers, the incredible explorers who bring us to today. We stand on their shoulders and that is the reason why we understand and have heard about these plants and these medicines because they helped us to connect to this ancient wisdom, which sadly we've lost so much of in, in the West. So it's wonderful to have one of the really great Indigenous explorers of Indigenous plants, Wade Davis, with us as well today to talk about the importance of those plants, how they work, where they can be found and what they're good for, what they're not good for, and so on. Wade is an absolute expert in this field. But to begin with, we're just going to show you a few little slides about Mind Medicine Australia. Just um, hands up, firstly, where you are in the world. If you want to put down the chat where you're from today, that's great. You can write down the chat where you're from and say hello. And um, also, for those of you that don't or have never been on a Mind Medicine Australia webinar, do, do put your hands up so we can welcome you to this, your first webinar with Mind Medicine Australia, if you're new. If you're part of our community and family, welcome. And so just a, a couple of notes. I mean, we, we're strictly apolitical. We're not aligned with any particular religion either. Our focus is on the development and use of evidence-based psychedelic assisted therapies within the regulated healthcare system. We don't intend uh, for people to uh, use these medicines uh, underground uh, in illegal environments. And our webinars are for educational purposes, and this is being recorded. It, it forms part of our webinar series, and you can find the recordings on YouTube. We know a lot of people have registered for this webinar who will be watching the recording later. So next slide, thank you. So here we are in this absolutely shocking mental health epidemic. And sorry, I'm just going to have to go and turn off um, some noise in my house. Just a moment, please. Liana, please We had a drill going on in my house and I figured I didn't want that accompanying this beautiful webinar. <laughs> so here we are with this absolutely shocking mental health epidemic in Australia and many other nations as well. So in Australia, one in four Australians have a mental illness right now. One in six are on antidepressants. There's been a 95% increase in antidepressant use over the last 15 years. One in four older people on antidepressants. And of course, there's enormous side effects and withdrawal symptoms uh, can be very difficult as well. This comes at a massive cost to human life and potential and an enormous cost to society and the government as well. Despite all our best efforts, these mental health statistics are getting progressively worse. Next slide. So the elephant in the room is the lack of innovation in treatments for mental illness. So you can see there that this elephant is trying to get the attention of the bureaucrats and the government and saying, look, current treatments don't work for the majority of patients. And they don't. And if you look at the next slide. Next slide, thank you. We can see that the treatment effectiveness is really not there and there's been no innovation in this sector for over 50 years. In the case of depression, in fact, in just in the last week, only approximately 15%, not 35%, but only about 15% of patients go into remission. 
with adverse side effects from a lot of those psychiatric medications. And in the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 10%. And of course, we have a whole range of other disorders as well, addictions, eating disorders, and many, many other um, early stage illnesses that could be treated by psychedelic assisted therapies. But certainly a more of the same approach is not going to solve the problems we're facing. Next slide. So Mind Medicine Australia is a charity. It was set up by myself and my husband, Peter Hunt. We're focused on ensuring that psychedelic assisted therapies can be used in the medical system in a controlled way. And for us, success means that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system that they continue to achieve the incredibly high remission rates that they've been achieving in trials and, and research around the world. That's research um, remission rates are around 60 to 80%, 60 to 80% of patients going to complete remission after just two to three doses of psilocybin or MDMA with a short course of psychotherapy. Compare that against the statistics I gave you on the previous slide. And of course, our goal as a charity is to ensure that these medicines are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need. Next slide, thank you. So our primary focus is on two particular types of medicines at the moment, psilocybin and MDMA, though ketamine is also being used in Australia. Um, but as mentioned, these only involve two to three medicine sessions and they're curative not palliative. So we're not just talking about managing conditions. This is a chance for people to get well so that they don't have to have a lifetime diagnosis of a mental illness. The medicines have achieved extraordinary safety results and there's no evidence of addiction. Both were granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US to fast track the approval process. And that designation is only granted to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments. Next slide, thank you. So how do these work? So particularly psilocybin alters the communication centers in the brain network. So reconnecting different hemispheres of the brain and bypassing the default mode network of our brain, which keeps us defaulting and stuck in rigid thought patterns often associated with early childhood. So you can see on the right, these two representations of fMRI scans. On the far right, you have a circle where you can see that the brain connections are not connecting very well. There's some very stuck and rigid thought loops, perhaps saying I'm not good enough, things are never gonna work out, my life's not worth anything, et cetera, that we often hear from people who are depressed. And the brain's really not communicating with itself very well. And then on the, on the, the, the the psilocybin circle, you can see the ingestion of the psilocybin leading to this massive neurogenesis in the brain, this increased neuroplasticity, this increased um, talking and connection between the different hemispheres. And that's one of the great things about these treatments with psilocybin is you get this absolute sense of connection and oneness, connection to self, others and the planet. And often, mostly, Mental illness is characterized by a lack of connection, disconnection with self and others and the planet, a sense of loneliness and separation and isolation. And this is the gift of these medicines that they help you to reconnect, increase your creativity and productivity and empower you to become an agent for your own healings, provided that you are supported through this treatment with professional therapists who can really help to integrate these life-changing experiences, which many people describe as one of the five most meaningful experiences in their lives. And whoever says that about a medicine treatment normally, you don't take an antidepressant and go, wow, that was one of the most meaningful experiences in my life. But with these treatments, you actually get this extraordinary feedback from patients because this is a life-changing experience for them. Next slide, thank you. And this is basically what we're focused on at Mind Medicine Australia is building the ecosystem so that these treatments can become available and supported in this country in medical environments. So we do a lot of awareness and knowledge building. So this webinar series is part of that. 
We work with different stakeholder groups, clinicians. Who's a clinician out there watching this one? Hands up if you're a clinician or a therapist of any kind. You put your hands up. And we also run a whole lot of summits. We run other events. We've started chapters all over Australia. We've also started the Leading Professional Development Program, our Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies, which is an extraordinary course with a world-leading faculty. And um, Wade, we must... Um, check that you're going to hopefully give us a lecture in that if we can if we can get you when you're not traveling to somewhere exotic my god I just heard Wade's itinerary and it's absolutely extraordinary but our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies has now trained over 300 therapists and this year we'll be training another 200 psychiatrists psychologists GPs counselors psychotherapists social workers nurses and others and we're training those therapists with this world leading faculty to become the pioneers in this field. And, and we've already trained many extraordinary practitioners. We also work with universities and the research sector and we're funding four trials currently in Australia. We're the largest funders of trials in Australia. And we also help secure that $15 million grant through the federal government, which has funded seven trials in Australia. As well, we're focused on Medicine availability, so we're working with a Canadian company, Optimi, to provide psilocybin and MDMA at very reasonable costs so that we can keep the treatment costs down because we're a charity and we don't want to make money or care for making money. What we care about is making sure that these treatments get to patients who need them. And we also work with clinics to develop their protocols. And, of course, very excitingly, as many of you will know, the first two patients in over 50 years, were treated in a clinic, in a Melbourne clinic, two weeks ago um, with MDMA-assisted therapy uh, by two different psychiatrists and uh, started the MDMA therapy with their first doses of MDMA. And, of course, this is, this is very historical and we're very proud of those psychiatrists who we've trained and we also provided medicines for those sessions. Next slide, thank you. So this is um, what happened last year was that we were able to achieve the rescheduling of psilocybin and MDMA as medicines in Australia, changing them from Schedule 9 prohibited medicines to Schedule 8 controlled medicines, and that became world news. And we were only able to do that because of the support of so many of you, many of you watching this and 13,000 other Australians put in submissions, 98% of which supported the rescheduling of these medicines. Next slide, thank you. And these are some of the other upcoming events. So we've got Wade this month, then we have Bill Richards, then Ron Siegel, David Nutt, uh, Terza Firestone, James Fadiman, and, and many other extraordinary, um, just extraordinary leaders and, and some of the most inspiring thinkers from around the world speaking on our webinar series and we also have a wonderful podcast series and our podcast series at the moment is focusing on those with lived experience and we encourage you to look at that and I'll ask Scott to put a link to the podcast series into the chat. Next slide, thank you. And this is about the Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. Our next intake starting on March the 1st and it's nearly full. I think there's about six places remaining, is that right Scotty? Yep. Even, even less. Okay, <laughs> maybe four. So apply now. We have a wait list. And then our next intake start in, is it July, Scott? Correct. Yes, mid-July. July. So, so put, yeah, so put your applications in and, um, you, you know, you'll have an interview and hopefully uh, we can accept you into this extraordinary course. Next slide. Thank you. And here's some of the teachers, uh, the course. Next slide. And... Lots of people ask how they can help this movement. So apply for the training, volunteer with us. We have an amazing learn section on our website. We need your support. We're philanthropists, but we haven't been able to do this alone. We rely on the support of both small and large donations. So don't think that a small donation won't make a difference. It will. But if you can afford more, please donate. There's still an enormous amount to do in this space to make sure that people who need it most can be supported. And we've started a patient support fund to enable patients who otherwise can't afford the upfront treatments of these therapies to get access to these treatments. So please help to support people who are less fortunate than you 
attend our events, talk to your GPs and other therapists so that people become further aware of these treatments and that we continue to remove the stigma and taboo surrounding these medicines. Next slide, thank you. Donations support all of this. We support also practitioners from regional and rural areas to get financial assistance to be able to do um, this training and, and they can receive partial financial support. And then there's lots of other things that our charity supports. Next slide. And we have some beautiful merch. We have a, Australia's first book of psychedelic healing stories, some gorgeous Mind Medicine t-shirts. We have some beautiful mushroom gift cards um, created by my niece as well. So <laughs> next slide. And I think that's all, actually, I think that's all the slides. And I'm now going to introduce Wade. I'm going to tell you just a little bit. I can't possibly do justice to um, really what an, a magnificent person Wade is. I've known Wade, uh, Wade, how long have we known one another? Quite a while now, quite a few years. Yes, I'd say at least 10 years or more. And I'm just going to tell everyone about you. Dave, Dr. Wade Davis, CM. So Wade is a recipient of a Canadian honour. He's a leading anthropologist and ethnobotanist. As an explorer and researcher, Wade studies Indigenous cultures and their use of plants for medicinal and spiritual purposes. He's perhaps the most articulate and influential Western advocate for the world's Indigenous cultures. He's a National Geographic explorer in residence. He's been described as a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. National Geographic Society named Wade as one of the explorers for the millennium. He was trained in anthropology and botany at Harvard University. He travels the globe to live alongside indigenous people and document their cultural practices in books, photographs, and films. His stunning photographs, which you'll see today, and evocative stories, which I'm sure you'll hear some of, capture the viewer's imagination. Wade is an absolute poet, and I think you'll hear that today. I have always been entranced and inspired by every presentation I've seen of Wade's, and I've been fortunate to see many. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to Dr. Wade Davis. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Now, do we have to share the screen, um, Scott, again? Or... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, right. Back on. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. How about that? Let's see that. Share. Yeah, how's that now? Perfect. Yeah, Good. And I, perfect. And I, well, listen, I, I, Tanya, I'm sorry, and Scott, it's taken a couple of years to get this together. Uh, <laughs> On, I'm delighted for your persistence, and I apologize to everybody in Australia for this terrible lighting, but I'm in a hotel room in Bogota, Colombia. I just came down from a few weeks with the uh, Mamos of the Arawakos, the sun priests, on a new project in the Sierra Navarra de Santa Marta. I only just came into the city today. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of just reflect on this psychedelic movement tonight, or, your time noon there in Australia, you know, it's fascinating when we, uh, sometimes when I'm giving a talk and it's one I'm comfortable giving, I sort of float above the podium and I look down at the podium and I wonder how that man who began life as a little kind of boy in a bourgeois suburb uh, in a very humble background of, in Montreal, how did that little lad grow up to have the ideas that are spouting out of the mouth of this character? You know, how, how did we <laughs> live through a time Women went from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, uh, gay people from the closet to the altar. You know, and how did we begin to think differently about the environment? You know, when I when I was a lad, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was a great environmental victory. No one spoke of the biosphere or biodiversity. Now these are terms familiar to school kids. And when we look at the kind of recipe for social change that has marked our lives it's curious how there's one ingredient that has consistently at least until recently been expunged from the record and that's the fact that millions of people in my generation lay prostrate before the gates of awe having taken some psychedelic uh, mm -hmm. not only would i think the way i think had i not done so i wouldn't write the way i write i wouldn't relate to the environment and nature as i do to women and gay and 
people of color as I do, I wouldn't have understood the notion so central to the body of uh, the corpus of anthropology, cultural relativism, the, the, the realization that every culture um, has something to say and each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. You know, my mother, when I was a teenager, always, you know, said, don't take these substances, don't take these drugs, you'll never come back the same. And my poor mother didn't understand that that was a very point of the exercise, to not come back the same. And I didn't. Um, and it was to my benefit. But it, given that, I, I think it'd be useful, to, especially for some of the people listening who may not be familiar with the rather remarkable history and the elders of our own scientific tradition to whom we owe a great deal of gratitude for the work they did at a time when psychedelics were virtually unknown uh, outside of the, uh, the, the very small academic group of, of um of, um, um, uh, of of scholars, adventurers, and and uh, eccentrics, um, and to, just to back up to think about these plants. You know, on Earth there are roughly four hundred thousand species of vascular plants and feeding on the light of the sun, and of these, only a few thousand um, yield food and, and medicines, and only a mere hundred or so yield compounds that can transport the mind to these distant realms of ethereal wonder. Now, these psychoactive plants have been called hallucinogens, but it's really a misnomer, for these plants don't induce true hallucinations, happily so. And the term psychedelic, which actually means mind manifesting, is also imprecise. I, th I think the best term is entheogen, which is derived from the Greek entheos, which means the god within, because the subjective effects and sensations of taking these plants, as all of you who have done so know, are so unearthly, uh, the vision so startling, that many of them acquired a kind of sacred place in indigenous cultures. And in rare instances, they were worshipped as gods incarnate. The Rig Veda, for example, makes reference to a magical intoxicant soma which dates back at least 4,000 years. And there's solid evidence that this may in fact have been Amanita muscaria, a, a, a mushroom that is used by a shaman in uh, Siberia and parts of Mongolia to this day. The active ingredient muscarine passes intact through the body. And so individuals can actually drink, at least in a ritual sense, the shaman's urine to achieve intoxication. Now, the Pharmacological effects of all these entheogens arise from a relatively small number of chemical compounds, and almost all the drugs have their origins in plants, with the exception of the notorious um, Bufo alvarius uh, toad of the Sonoran Desert, which Andy Weil and I published on back in the early 90s, the first um, scientific reports of an entheogen from the animal kingdom, these curious toads, the parotid glands of which of 15% of the content is purified in dimethyltryptamine. But most of these substances, including that, are alkaloids, uh, a family of about 5,000 complex uh, molecules that account for the biodynamic uh, properties of medicinal and toxic plants. Two major classifications of phenylethylamines, mescaline, MDMA, and of course, the indoles, the tryptamines and LSD. Now, in nature, these compounds can be found in all parts of the plant, just as the substances can often be consumed in all different ways, smoked, injected as enemas, consumed orally, and so on. But the really curious thing about these entheogens is their global distribution. And that says something about the role they play in culture. Like my good friend, Terence, the late Terence McKenna, had some pretty uh, far out ideas, and amongst them was the idea that mushrooms gave root to religion. Uh, but in fact, it's quite the opposite. Religion gave root to the quest to find these substances because the desire to invoke some technique of ecstasy to, 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 to periodically escape the ordinary realm of consciousness is so ubiquitous in the ethnographic record that it has to be seen as a basic human appetite. But the way we satisfy the appetite is not limited to these sacred medicines. It's satisfied through meditation, through dance, through ordeal, um, through through um, um, prayer, uh, and 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 we 
you can see that in the ethnography itself, because most of these uh, plants, it's even hard to say how many there really are, because the difference is Professor Schulte's always told me, citing Paracelsus, that between a, a, a toxin, a, a medicine, a hallucinogen is often just dosage. And there are many toxic plants that are ingested in ritual context, um, but they aren't necessarily hallucinogenic. It's, they can be simply drugs that take one to the edge of death with a with the hope that somehow one achieves some kind of illumination. But the really curious thing is that of the roughly 120 substances or plants that have been recorded as hallucinogenic, uh, almost 100 uh, or more are native to the Americas, and the rest of the world has um, contributed very, very few, not because the forests of Equatorial West Africa or, or Southeast Asia are depauperate, uh, and not because the people haven't explored those um, forests as real natural philosophers. In fact, the manipulation of poisonous plants is probably the most ubiquitous trade of material culture in West Africa. And to some, and, and to be sure, some psychoactive plants have been discovered. You're all familiar probably with um, ibogaine used by the Bwiki cult in Gabon and Cameroon. And again, the drug induces a kind of dissociative state and has been used effectively to treat depression and even addiction to heroin and cocaine. But in general, the peoples of Africa have another route to the gods. When I used to do research in Haiti uh, on voodoo, the, the Hunsi would say, you know, white people go to church and speak about God. Uh, Indian people eat magic plants and speak to God. And we dance in the temple and become God. And in most of West Africa, the access to the divine is through spirit possession, not through the use of any um, substance. And again, this is this curious idea of how the um, use of these substances uh, is fundamentally in Siberia and, of course, throughout the Americas, and has a very, very deep history in the Americas. This is the San Pedro cactus, Wachuma. I forget, Epanacactus pachinoe, the change of genus. But we know from iconography of Shavin, which was a pr prototypic civilization in the Andes, 2,000 years before the Christian an era. You can see here from Shavina Montada, the type site of where Jaguar invoking the power of the Amazon, but he's clusting in his hand clearly a stalk of that cactus. So this has huge depth um, in, in, Latin, in, in South America and throughout the Americas. And to begin to understand the role that these plants play in these societies, it's important to put them in proper perspective. For one, the pharmacological effects are not uniform. Um, like any, any uh, psychoactive substance, each of these plants has within it a completely ambivalent potential for good or evil. It simply creates a template upon which powerful uh, psychological facts, uh, forces can go to work. And those forces, of course, are culturally um, unique and dependent. And one way of illustrating that in an anecdote that Andy Weil has always used is that, you know, when people go in the um, in the forests of Oregon or the fields, I suppose, of Oregon, looking for magic mushrooms, they invariably have a pleasant experience. But when families foraging for edible mushrooms inadvertently eat magic mushrooms, uh, they end up in a poison clinic at the hospital. The, the mushroom hasn't changed. What's changed are the expectations brought to the experience. And, and similarly, the entheogenic plants consumed by American Indians induce a kind of powerful but neutral uh, stimulation of the imagination, a, a, a template, as I said, on which cultural beliefs could be amplified a thousand times. And what the individual sees in the vision is not dependent on the pharmacology alone, but on, on many cultural factors. The, physical and mental state of the participants, their expectations based on a rich repository of tribal lore, and above all, the authority and knowledge and experience of the leader of the ceremony. Now, the role of this figure, man, woman, shaman, paye, maestro, brujo, is pivotal. It, it, it's a shaman who tackles the bombardment of stimuli 
and gives it order, who acts as a guide on what is often a collective journey um, into the farthest reaches of the imagination. And these journeys, particularly with the substance like ayahuasca, are not pleasant or easy. They're not supposed to be. You know, this idea, you know, ayahuasca is not about the twiddling of thumbs. Uh, the, the, the shamans speak with language such as you're, you're nursing at the breath of jaguar mother and she rips you from her tit and throws you in a pit of vipers. That's what the experience is, is all about, you know. And, um, and, but critically, these experiences are generally deemed to be um, culturally purposeful. Um, they enter the realm of visions not out of boredom or to relieve um, restless anxiety, but generally to fulfill the needs of the collective. Um, they take the substances in highly structured forms that creates a kind of a ritual order, a kind of protective cloak of ritual that envelops the individual and, and insulates them from some of the stronger effects of the substances. And again, the shaman is a much misunderstood figure. We, we tend to see the shaman as being um, either a physician or a priest or some combination of the two. That's not really what the shamanic role is, certainly in Latin America, certainly not in the Amazon. The shaman is much more like a diplomat who has to maintain constant dialogue with the spiritual world. Uh, and from time to time, he takes on the role of a nuclear engineer who has to delve into the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. And above all, these substances contribute to the well-being of the people and, and, their, and their relationship with the natural world, with the Barasana in this wonderful photograph taken by Schultes in the 1940s. Um, the, the, the most profound cultural intuition um, is the notion that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. And so before you can go into the forest, you must speak to the jaguar master if you're expecting to hunt anything or if even to be in the forest. So there's this constant dialogue in which people are never the problem, only the solution, because only human beings maintain the harmonic balance of the world. That is our role. Now, much of what we know about these plants, and this is really what I want to address tonight, because there's been a real uh, gap in the information. I don't know quite why, but Michael Pollan, who's a friend of mine, in both his books and the Netflix series, seems to go out of his way to expunge from the record the core individual who was at the nexus of all the psychedelic research that was going on in the earliest of days. Uh, if you read his books, for example, Gar G Gordon Watson is said to have heard a rumor that they were using mushrooms in Mexico. As I'll explain in this narrative, it was no rumor at all. And a lot of this began with this extraordinary man who, again, for reasons that people like Andy Weil and I can't quite understand, has been left out of this modern revitalization of psychedelics, certainly by Michael Pollan, and, and uh, um, his publishers and the Netflix series. Richard Evan Schultes was the most remarkable mentor you could have. Uh, he, he was a kindly professor who shot blowguns in class at Harvard and throughout the 50s and 1960s kept a bucket of peyote buttons outside of his office door as an optional laboratory experiment for his students. Uh, he was the world's authority on hallucinogenic and medicinal plants, and he sparked the psychedelic era by discovering Tehuanacatl, its identity, in 1938, long before Gordon Wasson had even heard of the Mexican use of these substances. And three years later, he identified Ololuiki, the second of the great mysterious Aztec plants, a serpent vine, and then he took a semester's leave of absence from the university and disappeared in the northwest Amazon of Colombia, where he remained for 13 uninterrupted years, traveling down unknown rivers, living amongst uncontacted peoples, all in pursuit of the wonder of the tropical rainforest. In time, he would collect over 35,000 specimens, identify 2,000 medicinal plants previously unknown to science, and of course, any number of new hallucinogens. Now, the really the story becomes quite wonderful. 
he was a from a very poor family in East Boston. His father was a plumber. First of his university, uh, his, his um, family go to the university, uh, and he was a day student. He couldn't even afford to stay in the dorm. So he worked in the most eclectic library in North America, the Economic Botany Library of the Botanical Museum. And between the sort of monographs of Brunfels and of ethnographies of distant tribes and accounts of all these strange plants, he fell into trance and he took the course that had been taught longer than any other at Harvard, Plants and Human Affairs. And his professor, Oak Ames, was a real iconoclast. And all through prohibition, he insisted that the students brew, distill, and ferment copious amounts of alcohol, which they had to consume as a laboratory assignment. But when it came time to take these plants that were then known as the Fantastica, even Professor Ames had his limits. And so the kids had to do a book report. And Schultes races to the back of the lab, picks the thinnest possible book, and puts it in his satchel. And that night, scientific history was made because that thin volume turned out to be the uh, written by Henrik Kluver. It was the only monograph at that time in 1933 that described the stunning effects of mescaline and peyote. And so Schultes read through the night of these visions of orb-like brilliance that came down upon the imagination. He went back to see his professor the next day and he said, I, I must study this plant. And Oak Sam said, you can, but you must live the plant and read of it. And so Ames directed him to all the classic works available at the time on peyote, Lumholtz, others, and he learned of the Tarahumara, this incredible society in the Sierra Madre Occidental, who carried a peyote button and a dried eagle uh, head under their girdles for protection from sorcery. They could run 170 miles without stopping. Employed by the Mexican post office, the Tarahumara were able to deliver um, letters 60 miles in five days. And for them, Peyote was Hikuli, the spirit that sits at the side of Father Son. But the Huichol had learned of the use of peyote from the Tarahumara, and for them, they would have to leave their mountain home, taking on the identity of ancestral gods once each year to travel 200 miles to hunt peyote in the desert. And they saw peyote as the equivalent of tracks of the sacred deer, and they would eat peyote day and night uh, chewing the plant um, uh, that they may find, as I would say, they would find their lives. And this um, extraordinary um, um, cultural complex in northern Mexico inevitably would come into North America. In the mid-19th century, Juana Parker had been wounded in battle and in his pain and delirium, he had a vision of a new spiritual devotion based on the ingestion of a sacred plant. And so peyote moved into North America, not in pre-Columbian times, but very much like the ghost dance religion with its messianic hope that the buffalo would be reborn, that the white people would be swept away from the prairie. The peyote cult emerged in the wake of the collapse of the great nations. Um, uh, as a kind of pharmacological shortcut um, to metaphysical realms traditionally reached by the vision quest um, and the use of mescal bean, which is a poisonous and, and dangerous uh, substance. But carried from the mescalero Apache to the Kiowa, from the Kiowa to the Comanche, the cactus became the basis for a whole new visionary religion that, in part thanks to the work of Schultes, would be organized as a Native American church. And eventually, in an extraordinary uh, process of diffusion, a society each year for 100 years, peyote would literally spread across all the Great Plains, reaching as far north as the Cree in northern um, Canada. And those who opposed the use of the plant, as Ames told Schultes, knew nothing of its history and were completely ignorant of its importance as a medicinal plant and ritual sacrament. So with that backing um, and that understanding of the potential of the plant, uh, Dick Schultes and an anthropology student from Yale, Weston Labar, in 1936, with money provided by Ames himself and this 1928 Studebaker, pounded over the roads. And this young kid who had never been west of the Charles River 
found himself in Oklahoma amongst the Kiowa, and there in solemn rituals that would last through the dawn, he would eat peyote three and four times a night for two months of his young life. And needless to say, it was an extraordinary experience. Time, he wrote, turned into color. Um, thoughts unleashed sounds and gestures became rainbows of light. His teachers were Charlie Charcoal, Heap of Bears, Mary Buffalo, and he entered their lives. He became the last generation of scholars to know Kiowa elders who had lived the great cultures of the plains, a way of life that had withered and died within a century of its birth. His main informant was a wonderful woman called Mary Buffalo, wife of the keeper of the Ten Medicines, and her medicine bundle had 12 scalps tied to it. The Kiowa killed more whites than any other society per capita. They owned more horses. And she grew up to believe in the divinity of the sun. Um, as a young girl, she witnessed the return of war parties and the offerings made at the sun dance to the time the symbol of the sun. But as a woman, she discovered the affliction of defeat, endured famine and poverty, and she grew old listening to the brooding chants of broken warriors in the silence of a prairie devoid of buffalo. So Schultes, who has just come out of peyote ceremony in this photograph, and you would never know it from the red harbor tie that seems to be clasped around his neck, you'd never know that he's just gone with the road man uh, into the realm of the divine. But he returned from, from Oklahoma, a man transformed. In 1937, he traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify with, against the latest bill that sought to outlaw the religious practices of the Kiowa. In his undergraduate thesis, he wrote that through peyote, the Kiowa were able to absorb God's spirit in the same way that white Christians absorbed the spirit by means of sacramental wine and bread. This was a bold idea in the spring of 1937. But for Schultes, it was just the beginning. While still in Washington, he would make a discovery that would lead him in the realm, into the realm of Indiana Jones, quite literally. A, a famous anthropologist at Smithsonian had said that this mysterious sacred substance of the Aztec, Teonacato, was in fact peyote. Schultes didn't believe him, but as a young student, he didn't have the authority to challenge him until while he was looking at his peyote specimens, he found a note attached to a specimen from an anonymous, uh, not an, un an unknown German engineer in, in um, Mexico called BP Reco. And the note said, addressed to the f former and late uh, director of the National Herbarium, Dear Dr. Rose, I understand your man Safford says that Tehuanacatl is peyote. He's an idiot. It's a mushroom. I've seen it used. Yours sincerely, BP Reco. Well, Schultes, having just jumped off one Greyhound bus from Oklahoma because the Studebaker broke down, jumped on another one and went south into the heart of Oaxaca. And he knew that the early Spaniards had thought Tehuanacatl was a mushroom. And so as he finds his way towards the small Mazatec town of, um, of, of, of Wautla, he also discovers that BP Reiko was an ardent Nazi. And so a year before the Nazi invasion of Poland, he finds himself going to the mountains with an ardent Nazi as a companion. And to make things even more curious, British Secret Service is also after the mushrooms. This is Bernard Bevan, and, and they're coming at it from their own point of view. Um, and Schultes was, was the, the botanist. And so while, whereas um, Bevan and Johnson, who had died in North Africa, were the first to sort of see a ceremony, it was Schultes who collected the first specimen. And, and the, the prayers were said to be in a ceremony, the voices of the mushrooms speaking through the body, of the healer. But again, critically, it was Schultes who collected the specimens that were known as the saint children, the little ones that spring forth. And he reported this discovery in 1939 and 1940. But in a world moving toward war, a paper entitled Plantae Mexican II, the 
identification, uh, identification of the Tehuana Cotl, a narcotic by the Basilic Mice of the Aztecs, didn't receive wide circulation. But he returned the following year to well, let's take on the second challenge, the identity of Oluwiki and the serpent vine. And he showed that it was not Datura, as that Safford had claimed, but it too turned out to be a morning glory. Now, at this point, the war intervened. Reiko was murdered on the streets of Mexico City. Gene Johnson, the anthropologist with Bevan, died in the North Africa campaign. And eventually the story fell away until, um, and Schultes, of course, went to the Amazon, until the thread of the mystery is taken up by Gordon Wasson and his wonderful wife, Valentina. They were fungal files. And this idea that somewhere in the world, people um, worship mushrooms. They didn't know where or how. But it wasn't a rumor that Wasson heard about Mexico. Robert Graves, the poet living on Majorca, sent Wasson Schulte's publications. Wasson got in touch with Schulte's in 1953, just after Schulte's came back from 13 years in the Amazon. And it was Schulte's that sent Wasson directly to Wautla to work with Maria Salina. And over the course of three expeditions, um, Wasson and his companions, including the photographer Alan Richardson, were able to eventually consume the mushrooms in traditional context. And it was for Wasson a life-affirming transformation. He said that one, one, one struggles to even begin to explain what it's about. It, he called it a soul-shattering experience. And he wrote, we are all confined within the prison walls of our everyday vocabulary. With skill in our choice of words, we may stretch accepted meanings to cover slightly new feelings. But when a state of mind is utterly distinct, then our words fail. How can you tell a man who has been blind what it is like to see? Now, Wasson publishes account of that experience in Life magazine. An editor sought a snappy title, Seeking the Magic mushrooms and the psychedelic gold rush was was on and the challenge then became to figure out what were the actual compounds responsible for these effects and it was schultes that introduced wasson to albert hoffman and hoffman uh, received from the two of them for a uh, 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 48 mushrooms and wasson fed half the mushrooms to his dog and nothing happened but he ate the other half and something did happen. The laboratory began to look like Mexico. His assistant's pencil began to look like an obsidian blade. And he feared that he might be washed away in this whirlwind of color. Now, such an experience might have unnerved an ordinary scientist, but Hoffman wasn't ordinary. For years, he had been working on these indole alkaloids derived from the uh, fungal parasite, um, St. Anthony's fire. Uh, 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 um, a, a fungus that would cause tissue to become necrotic, noses would fall off, people would go crazy. And it was obviously a vasoconstrictor, hence the gangrene in the extremities. And he was working on synthesizing the, the indole alkaloid for medical use, particularly for hemorrhaging women, in 1943, when one day he decided to make again the 25th analog of the indole ring. And, and he suddenly got dizzy, and because of the wartime shortages in Switzerland of petroleum, uh, he was riding his bike to, uh, to home to office, and he, um, of course, ended up going on the most momentous bicycle ride in history because on his way home, what had seeped through his fingers and caused him to be so dizzy that afternoon was nothing less than LSD-25. And he went on the world's first acid trip. And then when he eventually got the morning glories from Schultes, he quickly identified psilocybin from the mushrooms. But what blew his mind is when he identified the active ingredients in the specimens of, of morning glory seeds that Schultes had sent him, what he found were indole groups very closely related to LSD. At first, he thought he had somehow uh, tampered, his, I mean, uh, uh, diluted or tampered or, um, his own specimens in his lab. But it turns out that, in fact, the active ingredient in Ololuiki is very close to LSD. So in a sense, Schultes discovered LSD in nature 
uh, five years before Hoffman synthesized in lab, and he found it in the humble morning glory, along worshipped as a god incarnate by the ancient people of the Amazon. Now, of course, by this point, things were rolling along at Harvard because Tim Leary had a subscription to Life magazine. He made his own beeline to Cornavaca in the summer of 1960. And like everybody else he wrote, uh, he came back, um, he was, had the veil drawn, I came back a changed man. Now, it's interesting, this relationship between Leary and Albert. They were both very serious psych psycho uh, so social psychologists, highly re uh, uh, recognized. And a paper, a study had just come out at this moment in time that suggested that no matter what the intervention in standard psychotherapy, uh, the patient, a third of the patients got better, a third got worse, and a third stayed the same. And so they were both in this kind of career and professional crisis when suddenly they found these substances that, as Tanya said in her introduction, are the keys to the transformations that clinical psychologists and psychotherapists seek in an afflicted patient. Now, the difference between these two men, of course, is that Ram Dass famously got the message and hung up and turned to Eastern religion in an effort to try to replicate the revelations of these substances through the ancient um, tantric traditions and, and Vedic traditions of, of, of Asia. Leary, of course, in a sense, became a prisoner of his own fame. And in that sense, he was viciously persecuted. I think for all uh, his um, challenges as, as an individual, he was a remarkable man, and he certainly didn't deserve to be incarcerated in a maximum security prison, San Quentin, in solitary confinement for months at a time for the crime of having possessed one joint of marijuana. But that turned out to be his fate. But the kind of pop culture that he that he inspired, of course, led to the kind of inundation of Wautla that was profoundly disturbing to the traditional healers of the town, just like Iquitos and Pucallpa today are experiencing the effects of sort of massive ayahuasca tourism. But the key thing, I think, to remember is that there was this marvelous moment when Albert Hoffman, Weston Labar, um, um, uh, Gordon Wasson, Schultes, they were best friends, and they were kind of pioneers in, in, in this time. And one of the signs of how quiet this sort of thing was is the guy who actually busted Timothy Leary of Harvard was Andrew Wilde. Not because Andy Wilde had anything against drugs. Andy was running a mescaline ring out of Penny Packer Hall at the time, but he was also the editor of the student newspaper. And Leary had told the president that he was not giving drugs to undergraduates anymore. Andy knew that he was. So strictly on an editorial basis, he busted Leary and Leary ended up getting kicked out of Harvard. Not, Andy had no idea what kind of history he was mucking about with. And of course, he and Leary um, had a, a rapprochement uh, not too many years later. But critically, even as all this was unfolding, Shorty's destiny lay somewhere else in the Amazon. He turned up in Colombia in 1941 when the biggest building in Bogota, the chapel and the steeple of the chapel on um, Santa Fe Park in, in Bogota. He quickly made his way to the headwaters of the Rio uh, Putumayo, where he lived amongst the Inga and the Kamsa. Uh, in his first month in the field, he reported no fewer than four new hallucinogens. In the mountain valley of Sibundoy, he counted 1,600 individual hallucinogenic trees. Um, he worked with Salvador Chindoy, and you can see that Chindoy's traje's clothing is an attempt to replicate the, the costume worn by the spirit beings encountered when men ingest Ayahuasca. Schultes then made his way east, further down in the homeland of the Inga. He discovered a new genus um, of a plant uh, known vernacularly as Yoko. The Inga rasped this um, um, liana in the morning, made a decoction, and drank a calabash of the substance. And within minutes, their toes and the tips of their nose and their, and their fingertips were tingling. 
the Schultes guessed that it had caffeine in it, and indeed it did. In fact, in knocking back their morning calabash of, of Yoko, um, the, the indigenous people were taking about 25 cups of coffee in a single shot. They weren't a people to do things in, in half measures. And then as he made his way down um, in, into the Amazon, he began to sense something that was beyond his imaginings. You know, he, he, he made one of the most important discoveries of his career. At the time, he was with um, William Burroughs. Uh, William Burroughs had gone down looking for the ultimate mind bending high. And if you read the Yahi letters, he goes to Bogota and he runs into a professor he calls Doc Schindler. Well, that was Schultes. And then he, he goes down to Macaw, gets rolled by a, a pimp, uh, beaten up by a thief, jailed by the police, and comes back to Bogota, tail between his legs, writes to Allen Ginsberg and says, you know, I'm going to give it one more shot, but this time I'm going to stick close to Doc Schindler. So he goes down with Schultes, and Schultes scores Yahé within a minute. And um, Burroughs has a session. He gets terrified by his certainty that the shaman has one goal, which is to kill him, and he bolts back to Bogota. But before he does that, Bill Burroughs actually made the first collection of the admixture that many of you are familiar with, uh, the tryptamine containing Psychotria viridis, which potentiates the beta carbolins in the liana. But Schultes wasn't too aware of this as of yet, but it was something that he had begun to sense. He would find out later in 1954 amongst the Yanomami one clue to the mystery. Those of you who have ever ingested a bene, the semen of the sun, derived from the blood red resin of several trees in the Barola genus. You know, these powders, Terence McKenna famous and said, blown up your nose. It's rather like he said, being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with a, a Baroque paintings to land on a sea of electricity. These powerful tryptamines, 5 methoxy dimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine, you know, they don't really uh, hallucinate. I mean, I used to argue with Schultes, you couldn't call these hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influence, there was no home, in, no home anymore to experience a hallucination because they completely obliterate consciousness and put you in a realm of, of just another state altogether. And, and, and of course, these powerful substances are snuffed for a very specific reason, and that's because tryptamines cannot be taken orally um, because they're denatured by an enzyme found in the human stomach called monoamine oxidase. They can be only taken orally, and it's not just the virola types. There's also yopo, derived from adamanthera and used at one time throughout the Incan Empire and, and, and the grasslands of northern Argentina, but again, a tryptamine containing seed, in this case, a different family of plants, um, the leguminosae. But again, these powders have to be blown up the nose. Tryptamines can be smoked, they can be injected, they cannot be eaten. And this is what intrigued Schultes. He didn't know that yet, but he found that the Inga, the Inga were using a, an intoxicant that he said could free the soul. And when the first active ingredient from the liana was identified, it was called har harmaline. And it was, it was actually called telepathine before harmaline to give some sense of the sense of a, of a common collective experience. And, and, and Schultes was a great experimenter in the, in the tradition of 19th century scholars and travelers. So when in doubt, eat the plant. And he did that on 28th of February, 1942. He started by just taking the woody liana. And, and two things intrigued him. First was the realization that the healer embraced the plant, both as visionary medium and as teacher. The plant made the diagnosis as if a living being. But also came evidence of empirical experimentation and the specific, a specificity that he hadn't encountered before with indigenous peoples. He claimed that Ingano, the Inga claimed that if you added to the woody liana a plant known as Chagrupanga or um, uh, or, or uh, Chakruna, two different plants, the 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 nature of the intoxication changed, and so he decided to test it on himself. First, he drank an infusion derived solely from the bark of the liana. Banisteriopsis capi, and he reported visions that were blue and purple, slow, undulating 
waves of color. But then he tried the mixture with the ad, with the added ingredients, Diploteris um, um, uh, 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 psychotria. What is it? No, dip, I'm, I'm too tired and sleepy. I just can't remember. Diploteris, and it, it contains tryptamines, right? And and here the effect was dramatic. If Yahe alone felt like the slow turning of the sky, the addition of Shagurpanga or Chakruna caused explosions of colors and visions. And he in fact stumbled on a bit of alchemy unlike anything that had ever been discovered because it turns out that the beta carbolines are monoamine oxidase inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines in the admixture allowing for this extraordinary synergistic effect, a kind of biochemical version of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. And the incredible thing, besides the sheer number of admixtures, he identified 21 in time, Psychotra Virtus um, and, and, uh, and Chagrapanga, which is Diploteris Cabriana, named for Isidoro Cabriana, um, Cabrana. Um, and unlike these, these, these contain these powerful tryptamines. And, and what astonished Schultes was not just the raw power of the substances, but what it suggested in terms of the wizardry of the discovery of the nature of the elaboration. Just think about it. The Amazonian flora contains, no one really knows, but certainly 100,000 species of vascular uh, plants. The, the, the only standard scientific explanation for how indigenous people made their discoveries is, um, um, uh, uh, is, is a trial and error, which is very quickly and statistically reduced to a meaningless euphemism. When Schultes was with the Siona Sequoia in 1942, he recorded 17 different varieties of this woody liana uh, Banisteriopsis capi that to his Harvard-trained taxonomic eye was a single species. And yet the indigenous people recognized the 17 varieties at great distances in the forest with great specificity and accuracy. And when he asked them the nature of their taxonomy, they looked at him as if he were a fool, because any proper botanist would know, they told him, that you distinguish the 17 varieties by taking each one on the night of a full moon, and each one sings to you in a different key. Now, that's not going to get you a PhD in taxonomy at Harvard, but it's a hell of a lot more interesting than counting flower parts. It also speaks about a different level of knowledge, and that's what began to in, 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 in intrigue Schultes. And of course, the problem with trial and error is that the elaboration of these, pro, um, these concoctions involve pro procedures that are um, exceedingly complex or that yield products of little or no value. Yahe, for example, is an inedible, nondescript liana that rarely flowers. Its bark is bitter, but so are is the bark of any number of forest plants. And an infusion of the bark alone can cause vomiting, severe diarrhea, conditions that you would think would discourage further experimentation. Yet not only did the indigenous people persist, they developed dozens and dozens of recipes. Amongst the Kofan, I recorded from my good friend Randy Borman, who's been made chief of the Kofan, an extraordinary story. Um, networks um, throughout hundreds of miles in the Amazon that would bring specific admixtures in, admixtures that could be used to yield potions of varying, of, of varying strengths and nuances to be used in ceremonial and ritual purposes. And, and so in the key to this, in a way, is that Schulte's entire uh, point of view shifted. And if he had been trained at the finest botanical institute in America, with every month that he spent in the forest, he felt increasingly more and more like a novice, because the indigenous people knew so much more, and they had their own explanations, their own rich uh, cosmological accounts that from their perspective were per perfectly logical. So Schultes, as a botanical explorer, 
had gone to South America because he wanted to find the gifts of the rainforest, leaves that heal, fruits and seeds that supply the foods we eat, plants that could transport individuals to realms beyond our imagining. Yet within a month of being there, um, he had learned that in unveiling the indigenous knowledge, his task was not merely to identify new sources of wealth, but rather to understand a new vision of life itself, a profoundly different way of living in a forest. And though mountains and national parks now bear his name in, in, in Colombia, this insight was arguably his greatest contribution. And so amongst the, the Barasana, for example, and these are photographs taken by Schultes, photographs taken by me, the use of ayahuasca is a profoundly collective experience. People come together for two days and two nights, absorbing ayahuasca all of that time, dancing as the individuals become not symbols of the sun. The coronas are the sun. The individuals become not symbols of the ancestors. They become the ancestors. And they fly away as a collective flock to go throughout the homeland, to land on the ancient sites, to reaffirm their sense of obligation, just as the earth owes its bounty to people, humans owe their fidelity to the earth. And this is the essential message of the Barasana. Plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. So this is the shaman, and this is Schultes. And Schultes would spend the rest of his life enchanted by the wonder of this forest, and if we were ever to name the individual that set in motion this entire possibility of a renaissance, um, much as Richard Nixon was the one in his political fury who mobilized hate for his own benefit, brought on this hideous war on drugs that has killed 400,000 Colombians, driven 7 million Colombians out of their home, 5 million Colombians out of their country, if, 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 if the darkest force of all was Nixon's political ambitions, the light force was Schultes. It was Schultes who set in motion this entire saga of psychedelic possibilities. And he's a man who should always be remembered and always honored, known to so many people as the father of the Amazon. Okay, there we are. Wow. <laughs> that was a poem. That was a poem. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you, Wade. Um, absolutely extraordinary as as always. And um, yeah, it's uh, very inspirational to hear hear what you have to say every single time that we that we have you. Um, Scotty, if you can spotlight um, Wade and I for the Q and A, and then we'll take the um, the questions. That'll be fantastic. Um, oh, you can't. Hang on, Wade's Wade's point can't hear. Hey. Oh, you've got something in your mouth. Hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Wade. I'm just going to go and collect some of the questions from the chat hmm. while you have that entheogen. <laughs> Maybe you're sucking an entheogen. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, here's a beautiful comment, a beautiful acknowledgement, amazing information and knowledge you've shared. Incredible. That was a trip, someone said, Wade. So some questions here. Um, let me go back. There's a question here. How in 2024, living in Australia, can an ordinary man or woman that is deeply interested in this shamanic culture reconnect and find it? Does it still exist and how and where is it still accessible? Um, that question. Well, you know, so, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, we have, we tend to be very pessimistic. I'm actually, this is um, something Schulte's turned me on to, um, Amazonian Mambe or Ipadu. It's a, it's a way coca is used in the Amazon. It's, a, it's kind of a champagne of coca leaves, you know. And I'm just oh. going excited. No, look. And what does it do? What does it do for you? Does it give you more energy or? 
Yeah, I mean, coca is the sacred, the divine leaf of immortality. It's the most sacred plant in the Americas. Beautiful. Much maligned, but it um, highly nutritious and uh, a mild stimulation. Uh, you know, it's um, the crime of the war on drugs is not just that people have been shattered, but um, we've all been robbed from of the one plant that is probably mo most useful. Uh, I mean, I've written 25 books and people always say, how are you so prolific? And well, there we are. And <laughs> um, But back to your question, which is an important one. We tend to get discouraged and think that, that um, the erosion of culture, for example, um, is a one-way street, and, and it's not. You know, it's kind of a patronizing idea. You know, we, we we think that these cultures, you know, quaint and colorful as they may be, um, are somehow destined to fade away as a failed attempts at keeping up, failed attempts being modern. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In every case, it's a dynamic living people's been driven out of culture, driven, driven out of existence by identifiable forces, be it ideological or uh, uh, political or industrial. And that's actually an, obser an, op uh, 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 an optimistic observation, Tanya, because if people are the, are the agents of cultural loss, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. So take, for example, in Colombia, a country that's done more than any other for the sake of indigenous people. Uh, when I first went to Me Too to live with the Barasana and the Kubeo and the Tanimukos and Makuna in 1975, it was a very desolate place. It felt like something important had happened a long time before. And um, the missionaries were there, the rubber um, barons were still there, uh, the indigenous people were being abused by the missions. And um, but then something remarkable happened. Uh, great Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, in 1985, said to a friend of mine, Martin von Hildebrand, a great anthropologist and activist, made him head of Indian affairs and said to him, do something for the Indians, quote. And in five remarkable years, um, Martin did more than something. He secured complete land title uh, for 57 ethnicities in the Northwest Amazon of Colombia a title that has been protected in the 1991 constitution of the country. And once the land was there and behind a veil of isolation uh, from the federal state caused by the conflict um, and the war on drugs, a whole new dream of culture was reborn. So for example, when I went back to make a film with the Barasana, with Martin, I guess it was about two, 2006, uh, we flew in a good friend of ours, Stephen Hugh Jones, a great anthropologist from Cambridge, and Stephen and his wife, um, Christine, had lived at the Barasana in 1968. And he had, he had, he had sadly reported um, um, to the BBC in a television series called Disappearing Worlds that he anticipated that the Barasana, um, you know, were going to quote unquote disappear. That's the language anthropologists used in the era. And so when Stephen flew in halfway through our film project, and he walked into the Maloka, these great grand communal longhouses, and he saw 250 men in total ritual regalia ingesting an ayahuasca. He jumped out uh, immediately in delight, got on the satellite phone to London and to his wife, Christine, and said, Christine, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that ever disappeared were the bloody missionaries, right? So culture is not always... Uh, um, and first of all, culture is not static. You know, it's all, all cultures are changing all the time. That's why I dislike the world word preserve culture. We preserve jam. You don't preserve culture. And like in Australia, if you think of your country, in 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal people were humans or not. In the 50s, ranchers quietly had quotas as to how many abos could be shot with impunity. In the 1960s, a great Aussie anthro friend of mine uh, from Alice Springs told me that he grew up with a, a school book that was using the national curriculum, uh, a treasury of wildlife of Australia or some such title that included the Aboriginal people as part of the wildlife of the nation. I mean, you know, it's hard for us to even think about that. I mean, like I just come back from the sun priests of the, of the Arawakos, a mum. In 1974, 50 years ago, when I first went up to be with them, friends of mine, their parents at the university here would say to me, 
¿Por qué quiere vivir con la gente sucia? Why do you want to live with the dirty people? Now, the last five Colombian presidents um, have made a, a trip to the Sierra kind of part of the national expression of unity, um, paying um, homage to the Mamos, who've emerged as a kind of a symbol of continuity and hope. And, and so, you know, these changes happen very quickly. So, you know, it's not as if shamanic practices are disappearing. Um, I, th I think, you know, it does get complicated in, in the, the kind of tsunami of um, young people, uh, you know, going as I did when I was young to seek an ayahuasca experience in a place like Iquitos has become almost a industrial. And uh, you get the impression almost of the more Shipibo shaman in Iquitos than there ever were Shipibo in the entire territory of the, of the nation. Um, but again, I'm not about to deny any young person the chance to have that kind of experience, but I would caution um, that there are a lot of mail order mystics out there and that ayahuasca is not for the faint hearted. And I would certainly not suggest ayahuasca as being the first entheogenic substance that a young person should experiment with, um, hardly at all. I'd say uh, psilocybin mushrooms or even better yet, San Pedro cactus would be a much you know, more um, useful. I mean, yeah, and it gets, gets you know, I, I think one of the things I've never quite understood is how people, it's kind of a generational thing. Anyone of my generation um, kind of looks kind of aghast at ayahuasca. I mean, you, you take it in spite of yourself, you know, uh, when you have to in ritual context, where, whereas um, something like San Pedro, I find so incredibly beneficial for one of the healing modalities that we often don't speak about in this conversation, Tanya, which is the most healing journey that of all for all of us, and that is reconnecting ourselves to the natural world. You know, you cannot take San Pedro and not be come away bedazzled by every organism that you cross paths with on a walk in the woods or the cheer miraculous wonder of photosynthesis, you know. So I think that's that that is 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 really something very much important beyond clinical therapy. We all, in a sense, need a therapeutic reunion with the natural world. Mm. Um, there's a question. I mean, there's a lot of questions here, so I'll just um I'll just throw them to you. One of them is here. What advice do you have for a young person looking to pursue psychedelics as a tool for human development and connection as a life path? I think I, I think you know um, it's the same old formula um, set and setting. You know that Andy Weil and Tim Leary spoke about at the very sort of beginning of the sort of sixties psychedelic era. You know, the, the, the mental set that you bring to the experience, if you're profoundly disturbed, uh, and I, I don't know any human being who hasn't gone through passages of, of, of depression and discouragement and, and so on, you know, remember these substances, they, they, they kind of, they, they can just, um, particularly the, not MDMA as much, but they, 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 they can just create a template upon which your emotions can only be exaggerated, you know? And so I think you have to be very aware of, of this. how are you feeling? Is this really gonna help you? And certainly if the setting becomes essential. You need a pleasant place. You need you need um, someone guiding you who can, I don't hardly have to tell this to your audience. I mean, I'm sure this is the essence of your work, Tanya. But that idea of set and setting and, and um, and, and 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 caution, you know. I mean, and and, and these different substances have different um, uh, outcomes, you know. I mean, um, I always tell a funny story, which makes me think of the utility of, of ecstasy. Because when I was, you know, some of the audience might know a book of mine called One River, which is sort of a biography of Schultes, but also account of Tim Plowman and I as young men traveling the length of South America studying coca for the USDA. And it was, uh, you know, Schultes used to say that the two of us ate our way through South America. You know, we discovered so many new hallucinogens and so on just by sampling plants. And, um, um, but I was 20, Tim was 30, and he was just about to come out as a gay man. He was still that ravishingly 
handsome to men and women. He had a girlfriend, but he was right at that cusp at the beginning of the kind of the, the gay explosion, if you will. And tragically, of course, Tim was of, of that first generation that just got hammered by AIDS and he would die at 45. I mean, I was delivering his eulogy when I had the idea to write that book, One River. But when we were together for the year and a half, it was an extraordinary team, an extraordinary uh, life-affirming experience for me. He taught me everything um, from Spanish to botany to how to hang out with Indians and so on. And, and uh, the problem was he was falling in love with me. And I was 20, and I, I came from a kind of an Aussie Canadian logging camp background. I don't even know if I'd ever met a gay man. I didn't really care because I was so open to anything. It was just unfortunate. I was constitutionally 100% uh, heterosexual. I just wasn't interested. I didn't judge it. But it was very, very awkward. And, um, you know, it could have really disrupted our friendship and our um you know, I, I Tanya, you know, I came to understand what you and every other woman goes through. You, you love me, why don't you have sex with me? I mean, how many times have you heard that, right? And um, and then one day, this other buddy of mine, another brother, uh, Leo, who Tim also hit on all the time, we were in the Sierra de la Macarena in, in this gorgeous part of this ancient mountain massif and soars above the eastern forests of Colombia. And um, we took this heroic whack of MDA, which is sort of a precursor, I guess, to MDMA, and naturally ended up naked in the sun. And all the little local kids were running around saying the gringos are drunk and everything. And I'm looking at this guy, Tim Plowman, who's, you know, incredibly handsome guy. And I mean, just dashing. I mean, the word was invented for him. And I'm suddenly, my head's getting closer and closer, my eyes kind of like goggles towards his genitalia. And eventually I put my hand under his flaccid penis, because you know with MDMA you can't, you know. And, and I start flipping up like a little noodle of spaghetti. And I'm 20 years old, I'm just saying, is this all I'm afraid of? Is this all I'm afraid of? Is it all? And, and we just laughed. And the funny thing about it, it didn't make me heterosexual, it didn't make me want to, or didn't make me sleep with Tim Plowman, he was my brother. But it just eliminated the fear and changed the whole dynamic. And I don't know, given my kind of butch, back, you know, more macho background in the bush in Canada, uh, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of conventional therapy I would have had to go through to have that immediate zaza and revelation that just changed my life and would allow, wow. me, actually, allow me to bury my best friend, um, loving him as much as I would have if I was his lover. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's a question here. Um, how do we create our own psychedelic culture over time, not just go in masses and disrupt other cultures to appropriate for ourselves? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good, a, a good, a good, um, a, a good point. Um, you know, I've I've taken. I mean, I've um, been involved with indigenous people and ritual ceremonies um, um, quite a bit. And and I've never, to be honest, um, found them as useful for me personally in my own growth. I mean, they've been very useful for my work as an ethnographer, or anthropologist, but there's a, there's a kind of constraining element to it. Um, I mean, for example, you know, the, the famous San Pedro cult of Uncabamba, which I did a lot of research about and studied and participated in in, in northern Peru, or the original kind of um, place that, thanks to Burroughs and Ginsburg's exchange of letters, the Yahe letters, that drew in the late 60s a lot of try in the same way that the Wasson saga drew a lot of people to Wautla, a lot of people ended up on that gringo trail, ending up going from Makoa from Sibandoy. And there was already a kind of a, a kind of a, a syncretic um his a campesino driven healing cult along those highways where you know campesinos would go to Inga healers and and seek personal uh relief for everything from financial difficulties, marital marital troubles or, or physical sickness. And, um, you know, there's a lot of alcohol used, you know, you're kind of in, a, in not in a particularly pleasant place. People are throwing up if it's ayahuasca. 
And 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 if you get into trouble, the shaman normally do what they always do, which is just go to sleep and leave you with a you know, puddle of uh, of mud. You know, so it, it's not exactly the ideal setting. And 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 there and there is also, um, by definition, a kind of cultural chasm um, of, of understanding between you and the healer. And so I don't personally think that that uh, one necessarily gains a great deal if the purpose of your experience is 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 a kind of a a, a, um, a personal attempt to come to terms with things. I've always found it much more illuminating to be in amongst friends in the control in, in a controlled space or in an open outdoor space. Of, of joy and and uh, and freedom um to soar you know um the most profound psychoactive experiences i had in all those years in south america um uh, were, would be when tim and i would find some new substance and um i'd always you know we always take a kind of what we thought was a moderate dose and then um and then if if it worked we'd take a kind of what terence used to call heroic doses and see where it took you but we we always did it in a kind of cautious, careful way. And we weren't, you know, we weren't doing it every day. It was when we found something of interest. But 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 I always found that to be so so I think I I, I think that the, the the idea of trying to uh invent um uh, deliberate space and even incorporate um without being you know too too uh, materialistic about it. Uh, your own ritual kind of um, attentiveness, you know, um, uh, acknowledging the space as a space of transformation, as as, as distinct from your your ordinary um, uh, uh, um, world around you. I, I think that's a, a good thing to do. And there, God knows, I mean, if, I mean, look at you guys in in, in mind medicine. I mean, there are plenty and growing every day. I would think. Um, individuals who are trained and capable of um of doing that and then and you know and i i personally it's, it's it, for me you know I, people have different um find different things in psychedelics like um i guess i'm sort of in the school of rumbus get the message and hang up you know i mean <laughs> john lennon finally you know claims to have taken before he died he said he had a million hits of lsd whereas george harrison um you know took it a few times and then turned to Eastern religion. And I, it's not that I've turned to Eastern religion, but I personally found that when I was trying to deconstruct the world that had been imposed upon me by birth and circumstances, I found psychedelics to be extraordinarily helpful and liberating. But then when I reached what the Indian Vedic tradition would say was a householder stage, and when I was building a career, building a life, building a family, I had no interest whatsoever in shattering it, psychologically or, or spiritually. And so I kind of retreated into that. And and I've, I've been thinking more recently, since I just turned seventy, maybe it's time to you know do a little bit of exploration. But I think that's I'll come I, with I, you. I, <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's a good thing for people to um, pay close attention to their personal needs. You know, everybody's different. Everybody's come to this moment from a different place, um, yeah. and you know. So I, 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 I think it's not unreasonable to use the word caution around. No, absolutely. That is so potent. Well, if you if you decided to run um a um a group trip, so to speak, journey pilgrimage with uh with this, I think that would be uh, extraordinary. Uh, I think we talked about it before. It's very interesting. I was just reflecting as you were talking. I think you might recall this, but we met all those years ago in entirely different contexts, talking about innovation and and you know you came in with your your wonderful um, your incredible keynotes to, to the conferences I used to run and you used to talk all about. I remember we we'd have these dinners with all the speakers, and you used to talk about um, these entheogens and and plants and trips and all this, I had no idea what you were talking about. I always thought, gosh, why well, he talks about all these things. I don't even know what they mean. And like, I had never taken any drugs at that stage. So it was like, he has such an interesting life. I have no idea what he's talking about. 
I was totally like, I guess, afraid of trying any of these things. It's certainly at that time. <laughs> it's funny how the world turns. Right? <laughs> well, I think there's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, let's hope that this revitalization um, uh, can, can help everybody. I mean, one of the things Absolutely. we're trying, I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about coca that we're really pushing hard is that, you know, these psychedelics have, have great clinical potential, but limited in, in the sense that the kind of afflictions that they are probably helpful, mercifully don't afflict everybody. But on by contrast, virtually everybody is afflicted by a kind of existential malaise. You, know, you wake up in the morning, you haven't got your homework done, or you, you got to get your kids off, you haven't done that report, or you don't want to look at a laptop all day. And if I told you that there was a substance that had been used benignly for 8,000 years, that would just... Um, you would not even know at any one point in time that you were stimulated until you discovered that you've been able to focus without um, um, without um, uh, 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 irritation or distraction for eight to ten hours. And, or coffee or I mean, sugar or, yeah. I mean, coffee's useless for that, um, you know. And you, you felt just a slight set of well-being that kept you focused on task, content on task, and just a little bit willing to take that create, creative jump more readily to write that first sentence or, or to paint that first stroke of, of a brush. And that this was a substance you could take all day, every day, uh, totally benign, uh, full of vitamins, um, more calcium than any other plant known to science, um, perfect for women in diets that don't have dairy products, enzymes that enhance the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, a plant that's been revered by every pre-Columbian culture, uh, going back to the dawn of the archaeological record, and, and, and one that is utterly benign, wouldn't that be interesting? Yes. You know, and that's exactly what coca is. And, mm. you know, coca is to cocaine, you know, what potatoes are to vodka. <laughs> And so the interesting thing, the real plant that needs to be liberated is coca, not mm -hmm. just the well-being of the world. It's not just that coca has been denied. The world's been denied the benefits of a sacred plant uh, that has no parallel and has been used for 8,000 years. And, and, um, and, uh, and countries like Colombia, where 150,000 campesino families grow coca leaves to survive, they need to be given a legal market. And by the same token, a country like Colombia deserves the tax revenue to pay the cost of peace, having drowned its treasury, I mean, drained its treasury over 45 years uh, or 50 years of a war that would not have lasted a day without the American consumption, the Australian consumption, the European consumption, the African consumption of this truly dark uh alkaloid horrible drug cocaine mm. no thank you for that um wade i um i think we're all like incredibly fortunate to to learn from you and to hear from you and um i'm conscious how late it is and you've been traveling non-stop and my god you just told me your itinerary going forward <laughs> um yeah. Get up so, yeah so we we want to let you go and just say Thank you so much. Thank you for being one of our advisory panel. We're we're honoured. We're privileged to have you in our in our beautiful global family, and for you to be teaching us from all those teachers that you've you've learned, those plant teachers and and those other extraordinary people that you've spent your life journeying with. It's really exciting for us, and um, yeah, we're just very grateful. And I'll um I'll send you some of that information, I promise, shortly. And um everyone, please um put your hands together for the incredible Wade Davis, extraordinary well, explorer of multiple dimensions of consciousness. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Blessings. Have a good sleep. <laughs> you deserve it. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar, which will be in March with uh, Dr. Bill Richards. Register now. Please bring two or three friends with you. Bill is just, just extraordinary, uh, very different to Wade. 
um, equally wise, incredible experience with these with these medicines and religion and meditation, and uh, you will find him extraordinary. He also is one of the most loved lecturers in our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies as well in teaching um, attributes of becoming a psychedelic assisted therapist to to the participants in our CPAC course. So aren't we lucky to have heard those stories today and seen those incredible photos which were all taken by Wade and um, yeah just keep supporting Mind Medicine Australia in any way you can. These webinars are free but we can't do this alone and so we encourage you if you got a lot out of this webinar and, and all the educational resources that we provide, please do support us so that we can help those who need it the most. Thank you all for your support and we look forward to spending a very interesting year of education and creativity and progress in this field with you all. And I want to thank Scott and Alan and all of our team for their incredible support. All our advisory panel ambassadors, our board and everyone, because um, we're making progress and it feels really good that these first two patients in Melbourne have been treated. So everyone keep asking, keep pushing for these treatments. And um, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you to my husband, Peter, for his extraordinary support uh, in this mission. Blessings all.